Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Bob Herwig, and I'm a professor at the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Victoria. And I have uh, presented a couple of slides here, talk about our work using the Niagara, the new Niagara computer. Um, I will uh, start the presentation here in full screen mode, which means that I only see my presentation and uh, I don't see the app anymore, so, but I do hear you, and so if you do have questions, uh, you would have to just um, do that via audio. Uh, and um, if, uh, if you do have questions right through the talk, uh, that is welcome. I may pick them up right away, or I may defer them to the end for, for the session. So my feeling is that we have maybe a mix of uh, in the audience of uh, maybe researchers, not necessarily astronomers, uh, but also maybe just some people generally interested uh, in members of the uh, Compute Canada uh, research computing community. And so I'll keep the science at a pretty high level and also talk about a little bit about the technical details and how the simulations were actually done on the Compute Canada systems. So uh, we have a group here at the University uh, of Victoria that is involved in this work. Robert Endersey is a CETA National Fellow. Um, Dennis Sankoff is a Senior Research Associate. Amir Toxin and David Stevens are graduate students. And then we have our collaborators uh, at the University of Minnesota. Paul Woodward has been the primary, the principal code developer for the PPN Star Hydrodynamics, Stellar Hydrodynamics Code, and he is supported by a graduate student. Um, so the advertised talk title was how HPC helped researchers simulate the life of the star. And, um, and so if this were a science talk, I would say large scale simulations of stars and the challenges of the cyber world. Uh, so this captures pretty much what I would like to present. Uh, this work is supported by a number of uh, sources. Um, certainly, foremost, our NSERC uh, support, but also we are members of uh, and supported by the NSF Physics Frontier Center, Joint Institute for Nuclear Astrophysics, uh, and uh, that is where a lot of the motivation for a lot of this uh, hydrodynamics and nuclear astrophysics work comes from. So, in my talk, I would like to uh, cover three uh, broad areas. Uh, I will first talk uh, about the science, the star hydrodynamic simulations of core convection in massive stars. So uh, during their uh, main sequence lifetime, the longest time stars spend uh, burning hydrogen in the core, and for massive stars, this uh, hydrogen burning causes the core to become convectively unstable. And so we have performed earlier this year on Niagara, uh, the highest resolution core convection runs ever performed, and I will briefly talk about what we have learned and uh, what new research directions have already, uh, and new research questions have already derived from this, um, from this uh, work. Uh, and so uh, then in the second part, I will briefly talk about the, uh, how the simulations were done on Niagara. Um, uh, some uh, thoughts, general ideas about uh, how to do large-scale parallel simulations and what enables the parallel efficiency of the codes that uh, we're using, and uh, then also some data management considerations, because very large simulations obviously produce very large amounts of data. And then finally, uh, if we have time, we'll talk about some general challenges of the cyber world and how to organize data and compute intensive research. So the stellar physics uh, and the evolution of stars. Um, so there is a number of motivations, and actually uh, I, I want to skip this uh, slide. It's a bit broader. Uh, more specifically to our uh, topic here. Um, so just for co uh, scientific context, a lot of the things that we know about stars is, is derived from one-dimensional, spherically symmetric models. So uh, stars are uh, living uh, and evolving on different time scales, on the nu long nuclear time scale, on the thermal time scale, and the dynamic time scale. 
And uh, one way to tackle this multi-physics, multi-scale problem is to, to simplify it by assuming that stars are spherically symmetric. And actually, there are, to a very good degree of accuracy, there are uh, spherical, because gravity is a great uh, enforcer of spherical symmetry. And so uh, this uh, methodology, one-dimensional solution calculation, has been very successful in describing global long-term evolution. For example, the 10 giga year time scale of hydrogen core burning uh, 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 phases of, say, one solar mass star like our sun. So why then are 3D simulations necessary? Uh, there are a number of deviations from one-dimensional, uh, from the one-dimensional assumption in what's called the macrophysics. And the macrophysics is really uh, the, the large-scale mixing modes, the convection, the rotation, all of these are things that happen in three dimensions. And as our uh, observables from abundances, from asteroid seismology, from the final supernova explosion become more and more accurate, and um, you know, the demands on the fidelity of our models become higher and higher as well. So if we're dealing with rotation, uh, maybe in magnetic fields, clearly these happen in three dimensions. The, the one aspect that I want to talk about uh, here is uh, the problem of convection. Uh, convection happens in three dimensions, um, and questions that we have are how effective, how effective is convection near the boundaries? How does mixing and convecting boundaries work? Um, in some applications, we have been investigating how convection uh, interacts with nuclear reactions. Uh, the feedback from convective time scale strong nuclear energy release. If you have sort of one fuel mixed convectively in another shell, suddenly you get huge bursts, outbursts. And how does that feed back into the 3D hydrodynamic mixing? Um, so these are all motivations. Uh, and specifically for convective core convection, which is the most important, longest lasting, at least, phase of the evolution of massive stars, uh, and, 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 and also down to two solar mass stars and immediate mass stars, there's a very fundamental question uh, for which we so far have only circumstantial evidence, uh, which is how does the mixing at, at convective cores uh, work? How much uh, material is entrained into the convective core to extend the lifetime, adding new fuel, fuel will add the life to the lifetime of the wind. So this is the motivation. And um, the work that I want to talk about that we have done on NAVRA is embedded into a program of 3D simulations that uh, our team has performed over the years. Uh, on the right, you see the way in which astronomers like to uh, plot the evolution of an entire star. And what we do is we, we plot the evolution of the temperature and the luminosity. Um, so stars would start out here on this main sequence uh, uh, a burning uh, phase, and then they evolve, they become giants, and they become white dwarfs. Uh, here are some other main sequence evolutionary phases. And so this diagram shows the different types of stars that we have simulated over the years. They involve the helium shell flash convection, no mass stars. They uh, include oxygen shell convection uh, in massive stars, and they also now uh, include um, double shell convection simulations, or hydrogen and helium shells uh, burning layers uh, interact in a, in a very massive uh, POP3 stars. These POP3 stars are stars that formed in the early universe from zero metallicity. So early universe, massive stars, low mass stars, all of these little stars here are in this diagram where we portray the evolution of different types of simulations that we have looked at. But uh, on Niagara, earlier this year, we started a new simulation program that focuses on the, the first convection uh, that forms in a massive star, the hydrogen core convection or main sequence convection in a 25 solar mass star. And that will be located right here. This purple thing here, uh, star here, is sort of the location of this main sequence on this uh, 25 solar mass star. So that is the context uh, for, for the simulations I want to discuss with you. Uh, and <clears throat> again, uh, here uh, we show this uh, so-called 
in this, in this temperature luminosity diagram where we, where we plot the entire evolution, the star starts here and then it burns hydrogen and then it very quickly becomes a giant and it ultimately explodes. And in this particular phase, uh, this diagram down here shows the evolution of convection zones. And um, so it's a, it's a time evolution of these mass coordinates. And, um, and this region down here, up to 10 solar mass, 12 solar masses that is shaded in gray, is the convective, convectively unstable region. And so there's a radiative layer outside. Uh, and, and then you can see how this convection, oops, I'm sorry, I, um, the convective region is starting out here, it decreases a little bit, and then uh, this black line here is the total mass, it starts with 25, and then here we're losing mass, and then other phases start to, to happen, and ultimately at the end this, this thing will explode as a supernova, but during this long seven, uh, ten, uh, 10 million year time span, 10 million years is sort of this time span where it is burning hydrogen in the core and it has this convective core that is shaded here in gray. And what you see here is the time evolution profile, time evolution result from these 1D simulations. And then what we do is we take this dotted line here, uh, we take that moment in time, we map that into a 3D simulation uh, and, a, and a, into a full 4 pi 3D spherical um, grid. And, and we put the luminosity in that you see here is the energy generation. We put that into the center, and that energy generation is driving the flow. And the next slide is showing a movie of how such a 3D simulation looks like. And um, we have tested this yesterday. Uh, we, I think that these movies come over OK. But I will, in a moment, give you a link to where you can download these movies in the full resolution. And so I would encourage you to look at them, download them, and look at them on your own uh, computer so that you really see uh, them in, in the full resolution, uh, both in time and in terms of the pixels. So what we see here is indeed uh, the volume rendering of the magnitude of verticity of a central slice of a four pi full sphere, sphere simulation of a 25 solar mass hydrogen burning core convection. And um, what you can see here very clearly is the, this outer rim, that is the boundary of the convection zone. In the center, we have this heating region that releases energy due to the nuclear reactions, not, not shown here, but I'm just telling you that is where it is. So we have the heating in the center. The heating will cause uh, uh, entropy enhancements in, in blobs, and they will rise, and they will drive the flow. And uh, in the outer layer here, uh, this is the stable region that we could see if I'm moving back one slide here. This is the stable region here. Not all of it, maybe only this much. And then this is the convection zone. And so uh, if we go here again and maybe move forward to this oops, particular point, uh, you can see that is the convection. So this is how it starts. Okay? And then it takes a moment to settle after an initial transient. And you can see the vorticity. Um, one thing that I would like to point out, maybe uh, looking at a still image here one more time, is that you can see from the uh, highly irregular distribution of the vorticity uh, and the small scale of the vorticity uh, that this is a very turbulent uh, simulation. You can see the highly turbulent nature of solar convection um, from the irregular yet locally isotropic distribution of this vorticity. And so this is a slice in the simulation. This was uh, one of the, simu this is the simulation that we calculated on the uh, Niagara computer. Um, we have done some simulations before. And so uh, this is the vorticity of a slice of helium shell flush convection. You can see the similarities. There's a shell now. Uh, this was done on the Blue Waters computer. In, at the NCSA in Illinois, and maybe two or three years ago. 
Uh, and for that simulation, we have derived, for those of you who care, uh, a power spectrum in which uh, of the uh, uh, radial velocity component at a particular radius. And uh, you can see that uh, for a large uh, range here, uh, we are recovering the classical Kolmogorov scaling uh, that is characteristic for turbulent flows. So uh, going back to the core convection, uh, to put this a little bit into context, here is an image of the radial velocity in a previous simulation of core convection that has been done by another team, uh, Gillette et al. 2013, with Mike Zingali and other uh, 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 people in that team. This was a 512 cubed grid with a low Mach number code. And uh, the radial velocity, uh, you can see here, uh, there is a black line. It shows you where the boundary of the convective core is. So in the next figure, I will show you the movie of the same quantity from our simulation. And uh, this is the radial velocity component. Again, in the same central slice, there is two colors. Yellow uh, and red are outwards directed flows. Uh, and bluish colors are inward directed flows. And uh, one thing that you can see is that after, uh, first of all, you can see a lot of detail again in this core, a lot of small scale structure, that nevertheless, despite a lot of small scale structure, it is also clear that if I stop this maybe at this time, there is uh, really, if we interpret this, um, this image, so first of all, here's the convective boundary, there is, uh, blue is an inflow, so there is a flow from the northwestern quadrant through the center to the southeastern quadrant. And so there is one flow that goes all the way like this. It is the characteristic of a dipole, sorry, I, I clicked wrong here, of a dipole flow that is emerging. Um, and so that is quite interesting because um, uh, we'll see that in a, in a, in a moment uh, again. Uh, it's a large dipole moment rather than sort of convective motions that go from the center outwards and back. Uh, there we're forming here this global uh, flow in this convective core. So that's the first interesting result. Um, so uh, maybe uh, uh, talk, I want to talk a little bit about the specs of this particular one. Um, so this one uh, was performed on the 1536 cubed grid. These are three building grid zones. And um, because the flow is a low Mach number flow, uh, we used uh, two, uh, uh, two million uh, time steps. So it was a very large number of time steps. Uh, the simulation was done uh, simultaneously on 1088, 1,088 nodes on Niagara. Uh, Naira has uh, 40 cores uh, per node uh, on these Intel Skylake uh, CPUs. We used uh, the hybrid threading, uh, 80 threads per node. And with that configuration on the 3 billion grid, uh, the uh, code was able to perform 16 time steps per second on Niagara, which uh, is really, I think, uh, a very impressive uh, performance. And um, the whole run, on, uh, uh, mostly on 1088 nodes, ran for 50 hours. On the right, you can see here a diagram where you see the computed wall clock time uh, for this a little bit more than two hour campaign, uh, sorry, two day campaign. And on the y axis, you see the simulated start time. So we simulated uh, approximately 60, hour, uh, 60 days of start time. Uh, in, 50, uh, in 60 hours of, of wall clock time. And uh, you can see that there is little horizontal pieces, and these are when uh, a job stopped and waited to be uh, restarted again. This was during the early access testing period where there were two, maybe three other teams on the, on the cluster, and so we had to coordinate with them a little bit. But then uh, you can see that uh, mostly we went here in a straight uh, campaign for on the 1088 nodes, uh, and then there's a little stretch here where actually we could, we decided to compute on half uh, that number of nodes and 400 
uh, 544 nodes, uh, and then the last stretch of was in 10 years. So uh, I can only say that that was a quite amazing in, a, uh, experience, and um, and so uh, for these type of large uh, scale integrated parallel simulations, this new Niagara uh, machine is is really very well suited, and and it is, it is perfect for this type of uh, large parallel applications, and we are very, very happy and excited to use it uh, in this fashion. Um, so moving back to the results, this is a movie of the horizontal velocity component, um, and it takes a moment for the initial transient to uh, get out of the system, and then the star settles into, again, this dipole mode, and we can see the dipole mode here quite well, uh, uh, after some time, for example, if I'm stopping uh, maybe at this point, you can see the downwards flow here, and then uh, the flow is going around uh, the, the boundary, uh, along the convective um, boundary, and, uh, and then where it meets here in the north uh, western quadrant, uh, the flow has to, it can't get, there's a stiff boundary, it can't jump out of the boundary, uh, so it can't go upwards, it has to go inwards. And in order to go inwards, the flow has to separate from the convective boundary. And so this is a classical case of the boundary layer separation uh, flow, and it is well known that such boundary layer separation phenomena are causing extra instability. And so what we find is that um, somewhat uh, contrary to what one might naively assume from a 1D picture, Flow, they're not going from the center to the convective boundary and then overshooting a little bit and coming back. Instead, they're going all the way around, uh, and the actual mixing at the convective boundary is due to these extra instabilities uh, that are uh, excited uh, or caused by the boundary layer separation um, uh, and basically causing extra Kelvin Hamhall's instabilities. Um, I'll get to that in a moment again. Another feature that you can see here are in the stable layer, this tangential velocity component shows us internal gravity waves in the internal uh, layer, in the, in the, sorry, in the stable layer. And uh, these are things that uh, astroseismology uh, potentially can uh, measure uh, uh, in these days with the new uh, present and new forthcoming satellite missions that are primarily designed to find transients, planet transients, but they also get very accurate light curves. And these light curves are encapsulating the little oscillations uh, that we see in these, uh, in these stable layers above the convection core. So, so this is very, a very exciting new research area that is possible because we can do these very high resolution uh, simulations. Um, so here I have side by side again the tangential velocity component and the radial velocity component for um, I believe it is uh, done 320 out of 500, so a little bit more than halfway through the simulation, and you can see again in the side by side view uh, in the radial velocity component combined with the tangential velocity component very nicely the dipole mo uh, dipole mobile mode. Uh, that the largest scales are assuming, and again, sort of here in these uh, layers, you can see the, uh, the mixing taking place, or at least instabilities. Mixing we could see in, the, uh, in, in another movie that shows the fractional volume, and uh, the fractional volume, um, you know, we have to work a little bit on a more dynamic color scale that sort of uh, moves along with me. But here, if we, t if we take just a snapshot here, you can clearly see that sort of where these flows are separating, that's where most of the mixing is taking place. Okay, so we have learned qualitatively already something that is quite different from what the picture in Monday would have been, which would have been blobs that are rising from the center to the surface and back again, and which might overshoot. So this is a very different picture. Uh, and, you know, this kind of uh, kelvin helmholtz induced mixing we have observed in other simulations as well, and sort of this is a, this is a shell convection simulation. I just want to show this, this, uh, this image here where, you know, in the zoom in, you can really, in a very similar situation, you can see sort of these little curls 
uh, appearing, these Calvin Hemholtz roles appearing at the moment where the flow is starting to separate from the boundary. So that appears to be a fundamental uh, element of the mixing, of, of convective boundary mixing, at least in the deep cell interior where uh, convection is mostly adiabatic. Uh, we can now do uh, a number of analyses, uh, and I don't want to go into too much detail. Um, you know, we can, for example, calculate from spherically averaged uh, abundances or concentrations. We can, we can determine uh, transport coefficients in 1D that we can then stick back into the 1D solution codes, which is, which is shown here. I don't want to go into too much detail here. Um, but that is sort of one other uh, impact that this, these simulations have by, by feeding back information into the 1D simulations and then uh, updating those. Um, another interesting uh, result, a quantitative result, has been uh, the measurement of the actual amount of material from the stable layer above the convection zone into the convective core. Um, and so we just do that um, by integrating the mass and train, uh, the entrained mass inside the convection core uh, up to the convective boundary. And then we plot this here as a function of time. And you can see that all of these lines have a quite linear trend, and that is the entrainment rate. And you can see that independent of the resolution over a wide range of grid resolutions, the entrainment rate is. Uh, essentially identical. There's a little bit of an offset because in low resolutions the initial transient is a little bit stronger, but after that, not seen here, but after that initial transient, the entrainment rate is the same. So the entrainment rate that we measure is numerically converged. It does not depend on the, the numerical resolution. What is interesting is that, um, so we, what we typically do is we're Increasing in these simulations the luminosity by typically a factor of 100 compared to the nominal uh, uh, heating. And we do that so that the flow is not quite as slow. Because we're doing these uh, explicit gas dynamic simulations, we're limited by the current free levy condition. We have to follow the sound speeds, which is something that we want to do to get all of these perturbations in the, in the stable layers as well. But it, it does mean that we have to take many, many time steps. And at the current resolutions, we're comfortable uh, to calculate these Mach numbers down to 10 to minus 2, maybe a little bit less. But these uh, hydrogen core convection zones are, are really very slow. And so we're increasing the luminosity by a factor of 100. But the convective velocity scales with the luminosity to power one third. And so what it means is that we have increased velocity by only a factor of 4.6 which is still a very, very slow flow. We then establish and train, uh, scaling laws for whatever we're interested in. And you can see here different resolutions, uh, different uh, luminosities. And we come out here with the nominal heating rate with an entrainment rate that is 3 times 10 to the minus 11 solar masses per second. Now, uh, that is 10 to the minus 4 solar masses per year. And remember, the lifetime of the main sequence is only 10 million years. So if we take this at face value, this result, then in only 1% of the main sequence lifetime, we would engulf the entire star, which is not very plausible. That, that is really implausible and, and not backed up by our observation of these massive stars. Now, I showed you this previous result from the Gillette et al. work in 2013, and they used the slow uh, uh, Mach number flow, uh, slow Mach number call, and their result is shown here, and you can see that it fits right under our scaling law. So in terms of the numerical convergence test, and also the fact that another code is a different uh, methodology gets basically the same result, we're quite confident that the dynamical response to this type of uh, simulation will just be what it is. And we have this sort of conundrum that derived from these simulations that we did that what do we do with these very large entrainment rates? 
So one thing that we have done and shown here is we felt, okay, if the entrainment rate is due to these large-scale motions, then maybe these large-scale motions would be broken up if we include the effect of rotation. And so I don't have too much time to go into detail. We did include rotation by just letting the star initially rotate and then see how it evolves. The, um, the different rotation rates uh, are reducing a little bit the entrainment rate as shown by these yellow to red uh, symbols, but not by, by the amount needed, not by a factor of uh, 100. Um, but I do show you here one of the images uh, of the rotating star, just sort of to make you curious. Um, and so this is a pull on view of one of the rotating simulations. Um, and uh, what is shown here, the quantity that is shown is the velocity perpendicular to the uh, pull on viewing plane. And so you can clearly see that flows are, there's a helical, there's three big gyrus and maybe one smaller one. And so these two are coming uh, out and the other one is coming, is going inwards. And, uh, and so there are sort of, uh, four, three to four gyres aligned with the rotation axis uh, where the plasma is following these helical flows. And of course then uh, a question would be, what about the magnetic fields, for example? So this simulation that we did on Niagara just uh, you know, answered some questions. They answered qualitatively how the global flow morphology works, both in non-rotating and rotating cases. Um, and how the convective boundary mixing works, what the physics, physical processes are at the convective boundary mixing. But at the same time, they've also raised some new questions, specifically how to interpret, how to deal with this too large entrainment rate. So we're now following uh, a new hypothesis that we will investigate in the future, and that is that these entrainment rates would be impacted by thermal time scale feedback on the background structure. And so that is something that thermal time scale feedback is something that we in, in plan to investigate in the future. Um, on this slide, I have a couple of links uh, that you can go to to find the movies and the images and also a small write-up that we made uh, a, a, a report to, to acknowledge uh, the, the use of our of the Niagara cluster in this early access user time uh, that we were uh, uh, able to participate in, and so uh, I, I encourage you to download these movies and look at them on your computer to see them in their full uh, resolution. Um, so I want to now spend another um, maybe uh, ten minutes or so. Is that how much? Is that is how much time I have uh, left to talk a little bit about uh, uh, how it was done and some of the cyber uh, aspect cyber infrastructure aspects. So first I want to talk a little bit about uh, the, the effect of large-scale parallel simulations. And uh, really these bullet items come out of uh, many conversations that I had over the years with Paul Woodward. Uh, the last one actually last night to just uh, recap some of the most important points. Uh, there are two relatively new papers out uh, down here, uh, that I referenced down here, and I encourage you, if you're interested in that aspect of our work, to, to look at these uh, two uh, very recent publications that discuss some of these things or aspects of these things. But briefly summarizing, um, the, key ch the key challenge for effective large-scale parallel simulations is that the processing on the cores is, generally speaking, fast, but getting the data there is slow. Um, and, uh, and one way to address this that uh, Paul Woodward has implemented in his codes uh, quite uh, effectively is to overlap uh, the time that is spent on communication with the time that actual computations are done. So for example, there are team leaders specifically set aside to deal with communications while the workers continue to work. So the whole domain is uh, divided into into compartments that are orchestrated by team leaders that manage the communications while the workers just do what they do best, which is to work. 
another aspect is that messages may need to be compressed into a smaller number of large messages instead of sending lots of large, uh, a large number of very small messages. Uh, in fact, this does require finding some balance, and that balance does depend on, on, on the hardware. And so as you're moving from one hardware generation to the next, this sort of the ideal message size is something that needs to be readjusted. But generally speaking, the challenge I think going forward uh, appears to be that processes get faster, but the network is not getting faster at the same rate. And so ultimately, that is going to be a challenge where we may run out of tricks to sort of to, to deal with this particular issue. And that would then affect ultimately the scalability of these types of calls. Um, another aspect of this particular code is that it is a dedicated code to just do this type of problem. And so it is not a general purpose code. We would not be able to do mergers of stars, for example. And so uh, that, of course, is, can be considered a disadvantage, but it is an aspect of uh, how to be able to generate this very large scale uh, effective uh, uh, efficiency. Uh, then maybe also one aspect is that uh, Paul Woodbury has been very diligent in picking up lots of small 10 or 20 percent factors. And it turns out that if you do that, uh, you, you can accumulate uh, factors that, that, that do make a difference as well. So uh, very efficient computations are only possible if you really care about every 10 or 20 percent effect that you possibly can, which of course is a lot of labor and requires dedicated effort. Um, uh, another interesting thing that I only became aware of through this work with, with my collaborator is that, of course, we need to be, keep in mind that different types of operations cost differently. Uh, there are logical operations for additions and multiplications that cost one flop each, but there is no such logical operation for a sine, cosine, or even a divide, which costs 14 flops each. Um, and then finally, I would say that uh, you know, doing, solving a problem the way the computer likes to solve it is often not the way how a mathematician would like to do it. So for a spherical problem, you might think that spherical coordinates are good, but considering that a sine or cosine costs 14 times as much as a multiplication or addition, that is probably not the best way to do it uh, on the computer efficiency. Now I want to move over to general cyber challenges. And one comes with the fact that, of course, large-scale simulations produce large amounts of data. Now, if we would approach this naively, a quick check would just tell us that we would run into trouble very quickly. One dump, uh, so saved uh, time step, uh, for four quantities on a 1536 cube grid in eight byte uh, precision uh, just for four quantities are 115 gigabytes. And so at a typical disk read speed, that's 20 minutes. And if you want to transfer your own network, uh, because you have like an analysis server somewhere else in the cloud, for example, uh, then that takes 1.6 hours. And you know, if you multiply this with the number of time steps that you have saved, we're typically saving, out of the 2 million time steps we make, we're saving 500. Um, then you quickly realize that you can't, you can't analyze this type of data anymore. So large data sets require two things to work with these large storage databases. They require remote access to work with the data where the data is, and they also require smart data management strategies. Um, and then there's a couple of other uh, challenges, and they're listed here. Um, you know, what I would say maybe to highlight is that, um, that an effective strategy for research and management is, uh, I think, only be, can only be had in this context if we're combining, oops, sorry, if we're combining the access to data with data-specific analytic, analytic tools uh, and the capability to execute those analytic tools. And hopefully I'll have time to quickly show you an example for this. Um, there's also other issues, which are, you know, how to share workflows, legacy software, reproducibility of science, and so on. So for PPM star, um, here are a couple of tricks that we are deploying uh, 
uh, that really come out of uh, decades long experience that Woodward has accumulated with these types of applications. So first of all, uh, there is, instead of just writing out raw data in 8 byte in full resolution, we're dividing the outputs into four different data types that are all compressed in, in, in different ways. And so the idea here is that we're, first of all, creating science-ready analysis data as well as images, which, by the way, I think is, is a substantial departure from, from uh, common practice, at least in many astro astronomy uh, applications that I'm aware of. And so uh, we're, for example, applying algorithmic compression. And, and what is algorithmic compression? So uh, if you take this sort of schematic diagram here at the bottom, you can have an appropriately scaled code units, uh, a large, uh, you, you will, by, by choosing appropriate code units, you will sort of focus the dynamic range on a, on a relatively, ideally, on a relatively small uh, uh, range, uh, dynamic range in, in number, in real number space, um, where very large numbers are probably never occurring, and very small numbers also will not occur, and if they do occur, they may not be important. And so we're mapping uh, this uh, double, uh, full precision uh, code unit number space to, uh, we, are, we are a transform like this one, something like in hyperbolic tangents or something similar, uh, to an algorithmically compressed quantity that only varies between minus one and one. And then you can, you can map that to either two bytes uh, or, or even one byte. So there is a, a to one byte. And so, for example, we're saving these bricks in full resolution of one byte quantities algorithmically compressed. We make images from these. So the images that you saw in the movies are made from these bricks of bytes, as we call them. Uh, but then there's also spatially filtered uh, data by a factor of four in each direction. And actually, this is a typo. There is two byte uh, precision on those. But we can put lots of primary and also derived quantities, stuff that you might need for analysis of turbulence, for example, products of averages, average and product. We can put those in and we generate these derived quantities already inside the code for later analysis on this reduced spatial resolution grid. Then we have radio profiles, and then we also have the spherically average profiles of lots of things, and, and they don't take any space. And then we have these images. So a lot of the data analysis take is taking place already inside the code. And so as a result, if we take one of our medium-sized grid ones, 768 cubed, say, for example, this one has 1 million time steps, and we're writing on 466 dumps. We're separating this out. We keep the, this uh, spatially filtered data and the radio profiles. We keep that in project space on Niagara. It is just 260 gigabytes. And then we're separating out the some three restart dumps and our uh, uh, BOP files that we can use in, for use for images. And those go on near line, and this is just 630 volts. So all of this together is well under one terabyte for an entire 768 cube line. Uh, and so with that, we can really live quite confidently. Um, I, could, I could stop here, but I could continue for five minutes to talk a little bit about our cyber hub uh, technology. And if no one stops me, I will take those five minutes uh, maybe and continue. So, the, um, so with this data management strategy, we're now ready to, to actually uh, serve da output data uh, in a way that actually becomes accessible through web browser technologies. And uh, one of the things that we have found out is that um, a lot of the research on these very complex uh, simulations and data sets, uh, also some that we're doing in conjunction with our solar evolution nuclear synthesis calculations with many international collaborators, require access to the data uh, that by, by different uh, collaborators, different groups of collaborators, but they require data access not just to download the data because it is too large to download, also too complex. It requires access uh, to the data that comes along with the tools to do something to analyze the data and the ability to 
execute the analytic tools onto the data. And in order to solve this problem, how to do that, we have developed uh, an infrastructure that we call Cyber Hubs. It is uh, published in a paper in a special uh, issue of APJ Supplements called Data Insights and Challenges in the Time of Abundance. Here's our article. It was covered on the AAS NOVA page uh, uh, on May 11th. And so uh, I want to briefly talk about what these cyber hubs are. They are, um, so this is the paper, uh, they are a system uh, of an easy to deploy package uh, intended for small, medium sized collaborations. The system is based on the Jupyter and Docker technologies, which allows web browser enabled remote and interactive and then access to shared data. Um, we use this for several years now, for two years, uh, constantly to share data with our new classrooms colleagues, and we're also now starting to use it to share our PPMs or Hydra data. It is a system that uh, is fully available on GitHub in our Cyber Laboratories repository, and uh, it comes in a certain uh, uh, configuration where you have to follow the uh, 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 instructions. Uh, it is specifically designed to be deployed on the Abudus, Westgate Abudus cloud, and that is where all of our cyber hubs servers are working. And the idea is, oh, and, and also, uh, as a matter of fact, you don't have to build anything because it is built on the Docker. Uh, uh, technology, and I should really say before I forget that the live MOA from our local VESPA team here has helped a lot, uh, has helped us a lot to put this together. So all of this is on, on the uh, Docker Hub repository where you just download these Dockers and you could install uh, uh, launch this on the, the Arbutus cloud in the same way we do. And um, so this is sort of the, these are a couple of the images from the paper. Uh, I don't want to go into too much of the technical details because I'm running fast out of time. But the idea is that you have some, some kind of core hub that manages the multi, multiple users being able to log on and then they can select uh, a couple of pre-built applications that gives them a custom uh, software environment, say for example for the analysis of solar hydro or for the analysis of nuclear synthesis data or even to run some simulations. And so um, I have a demo uh, that I could show you maybe instead of the still images. And so there's two demos. Um, uh, one is uh, going to a server called rendy1.tins.unic.ca. And that is serving cell evolution, nuclear astrophysics data, and the nuclear yields data set. So that is a different project in our group. It also allows you to run small simulations, for example, one dimensional cell evolution simulations with MESA or galactic chemical evolution simulations. And the second demo is, um, is about uh, serving uh, uh, cell hydrodynamics simulations. And so um, I will go out of my presentation here. And I will um, select um, here a browser. So, so I will. I want to do the hydro demo first because uh, I think it is more to the point here. Um, you can see here one of our publications. Uh, this is the paper about oxygen shell burning, uh, and it was published uh, last year. And it has lots of data analysis and lots of plots. And I don't have time to go through them, but um, for example, uh, down here are some plots that show, oops, that was too fast, that show, uh, oops, let me see. Here are some plots that show Sort of the tangential velocity in different directions um, as a function of radius. And so what we have done is we have um, on our publicly available GitHub repository, we have, and you could go there, PPM star, PPM notebooks. We have for this paper, Jones et al. 2017, created a set of notebooks that essentially uh, create all of the plots 
that are shown in the paper. And then uh, you can take these notebooks and uh, you can go to our server astrohub.ubic.ca and you will be, well, you would have to, if you really want to do it, you would have to contact us right now. This is not right now a public uh, server, but if you're really interested in it, we are on a one on one basis. We're willing to give you access. In the future, we're planning to make it totally open, the public, publicly open. The other demo that I uh, mentioned is actually publicly open. The Wendy one that fits at UV.ca. You can go right now, log in with your GitHub account, and explore. There's some documentation. Uh, this one here uh, would allow you to go. Uh, to the PPN star notebooks that are preloaded into the PPN star uh, CyberHub application. So you would see uh, these notebooks here that are coming from the GitHub repository. And uh, then you would go maybe to the plot radio buckets uh, uh, notebook that is supposed to make these uh, uh, bucket plots or these radio profile plots. You are importing our PPM Pi module for data analysis, and then uh, the data is staged on uh, on, on a mount point to this uh, CyberHub application. This is running actually in the Arbutus cloud. So AstroHub.ca is a, is actually running in the cloud as we speak. So I can read this data as I'm doing here right now, and then uh, I go. Um, to, the, to the next uh, cell here, and there is the method to do this plot, PPM upper bound, and you can see how, as we speak, um, I'm creating uh, this plot here uh, that is identical uh, to the one in the paper. And so that is one way how we're working ourselves. We're creating, we're using the astrobs to create our own research data products. But we're, this is also one way how we are sharing our uh, hydrodynamic simulations. They are, of course, uh, very expensive to create, not only in terms of the actual computing time, but also in terms of the research and development time. Uh, but this is how we can share this with a broader uh, group of researchers who might have other questions to these data sets and would like to analyze them in different ways. So this is uh, a demo. I don't have time for the second demo, but um, there is some documentation there. You can sort of go to the venue one that is the UBIT.ca yourself if you like. If you have more questions about this, then please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, and so I'm coming to my summary. We're addressing and solving many of these model standard challenges in STEM physics. Uh, and really, um, this new uh, class event we have, Niagara, I would say allows us for the first time to really, we're running this in the normal batch queuing mode. Uh, I would like to say uh, that one of the things that makes this possible is that the, the setup of the queuing system in Niagara is expertly done. Uh, the people in charge there do understand that the only way that we can do these large scale parallel simulations in the normal queuing system is to have very short ball clock times on Niagara is uh, 12 hours, I think, uh, maybe 24 if you have a rack, and it should not be any longer, and that is very good. This makes sure that we can run these parallel calculations. Um, yeah, and so I'll leave up my summary, summary here, and, um, and that was my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Fox, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, if anybody from the audience has any question, please uh, unmute yourself and you can ask by audio. Okay, um, I have a question. So uh, when I was looking at these movies, I was really struck that there are no grid orientation effects in these simulations. So typically when you model spherical things on a Cartesian mesh, you will have a uh, grid orientation effect. So, I mean, uh, you can see that your, your, your spherical star will become a, a box, a, a cubic box, right? Yeah. So, and, and there are no such effects at all. So clearly a lot of effort has gone into, in the code has gone into 
making sure there are no grid orientation effects whatsoever. So the three-dimensional updates are all truly three-dimensional and so on. Yeah. So, well, um, so one key secret is that um, is simply resolution. And it's one of these cases where, you know, if we don't, if we do go down and I mean, yes, there is, and I, there is a paper that, uh, we, that is available that describes specifically this particular point. I'm pulling it up right now here. It is an APJ paper from 2015. Uh, it has an appendix that describes the high order advection scheme and this PPM hydrodynamic method. And we do go through showing, uh, actually in that paper in figure one, the grid effect on the 1536 cubed simulation that you see early on. So there is no, we're not sort of prepping this with some kind of convective-like initial perturbations because we just say, well, there's always some kind of perturbation in the grid. Um, and so we just let this go. And you can see in these four panels how the initial condition the first thing that you do see is a grid effect. That is when the actual signal from the convection is very, very small. And then you go a little bit further and there's still a grid effect. But then after the convection really gets going, uh, the signal is overwhelming the, um, the, the, the grid effect. And one of the reasons why we, why we are at these relatively high resolutions is that we always make sure by doing more resolution runs, like where are the systematics, where are grid effects appearing. Uh, but it turns out that um, for these simulations, if they're run at high enough uh, resolutions, uh, in this fashion, where we can actually parallelize them very effectively, uh, we, we do not have these grid effects. But that's a good point. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay. We, we find these Cartesian coordinates to be actually the most efficient way to have a large scale parallel and then get the highest forms of resolution answers. Are there any other questions? Okay, well, if there are no further questions, uh, then uh, thank you very much, Falk, for this presentation. And as I mentioned, uh, this presentation it has been recorded, so it will be posted online uh, in a few or in a few days uh, on our training materials webpage. And uh, I guess if you have any questions or topic recommendations, please uh, send us an email, info at westgrid.ca. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And thank you, Falk. Yes, goodbye.